Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe believe. this is the word of God. God. I believe what God says says. because it is impossible impossible. for God to lie. Well, we've been talking about rebuilding relationships. We've been talking about how to recover from bad relationships and just basically relationships in general. And today, what I'd like to talk to you about Uh, First of all, let's just make this comment. Uh, I want to review just for a few moments. If you want to have a great relationship with anybody in the world, I don't care who it is, whether it be a relative, in a marriage, neighbors, friends, somebody you work with at school, you have got to get your relationship straight with God first. You can't have a relationship straight with anybody else until you've got it worked out between you and God. And then... And there's nothing hindering you from that. There's no excuses for not doing that. And then you need to get your relationship worked out with yourself. You know, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Some people don't love their neighbors because they don't love themselves. You'll never be able to love anybody else any more than you can love you. And sometimes you don't love you because you know what you've done in the past. And you get concerned about the past. Well, let me tell you something about the past. It's past. And you have been forgiven. God has forgiven you, so forgive yourself. And then the next thing is you can start working on relationships with other people. And there's some things you need to know. And some of the things we've covered is one thing is because you you may have a bad relationship, but it may not be your fault. And then (laughs) it may be your fault. You know, but it may not be your fault. Everything that happens in life is not your fault. Sometimes you can be doing the right thing at the right place, and everything is just going smooth, and then disaster strikes. And you you really didn't do anything bad. I'm going to quickly give an example I've given in the past, but when Loretta and I lived in Kansas City, uh, we had an apartment, and the apartment was next door to a, a policeman. And uh, I, I didn't smoke pot. I, I wasn't on drugs. I was in a rock and roll band and probably looked like I did. And so I did not associate with him real a, a lot. But he was a nice guy. He, he really was. He was a nice guy. And uh, Loretta and I had... Uh, Now, the details, I'm not totally sure why we left, but we left town for a few days. But we had made a mistake and left the turkey that we had eaten part of, left it sitting out on the counter. And when we got back, and it was hot summer, when we got back and I opened up the door to our apartment, the fumes... You could have lit a match and blown the place up. I mean, it was gaggy. I could not get inside the apartment at all. I mean, we, I had to go to the other side of the apartment, the other side of the apartment, and open the door on the other side and let the breeze flow through. And then I could barely get inside. That turkey in that pan had decomposed and had gone into a state of rottenness. Rottenness. I mean, it was, it was goo. It was sticky, smelly, gooey turkey. So Loretta wouldn't come in the house. She, I mean, she was outside. She just said, I'm not going in. You know, we're going to have to burn this place down. And uh, so the guy who had the apartment next to us, uh, our kitchens went up against each other that way they could put all the plumbing together you know like our apartment had to sink up against this wall and his apartment had to sink up against the same wall so we shared the same sink drains well he knew we were out of town and evidently he'd had a clog in his sink for some time and so he decided this was the time to fix it so what he did on his side of the wall is he took all of the plumbing stuff out from under the sink, and in order to work on it, he had gotten up into the cabinet under the sink. You know, right? Well, okay, I'm on my side of the wall, 
And Loretta's out gagging in the car. I thought our marriage was over. It was, it was bad. And, you know, we were pointing fingers who left that out and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, it was her. Uh, no, it wasn't. But I got, I, I, I remember reaching out and grabbing the turkey to put it into a, a sack or something. And when I did, it, it, it's like it just, it was like oozy, gooey. I, I can't even describe it. And I got the bones into a bag and I had this pan full of just super smelly, rotten, ooey, gooey. Hey, what do you do? You pour it down the drain. So I just, I mean, I, I needed to get this stuff out of the house, so I started pouring it down the drain. It filled up the sink, and it was going bloop, 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 bloop. And all of a sudden, I hear on the other side of the wall, screaming and yelling. This policeman is up under the sink, <laughs> under the drain, and my drain comes into his side. And he can't get out. He's stuck in there. And all this stuff's going all over him. Now, here, here, here's the moral of the story. He didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> he didn't. He was, he was doing the right thing. He was fixing a sink. His wife was going to be very pleased with him when he got that sink fixed. <laughs> and in the middle of him doing the right thing the right way, I still remember that smell. It's been all those years. See, and here's the thing. You may be like the guy under the sink. You're just going along, fixing something, everything's going good, and then all of a sudden, all the, the poo in the world starts coming on top of you. And then you start saying, well, what did I do? What did I do to, well, you know what? Maybe you didn't do anything. Now, I, I would imagine he's probably to this day still taking an extra shower every week. Um, see, some people will do things and, and they will offend you when you didn't do anything wrong. You know, but the Bible says something about that. Take a look in um, Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. It says, Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. Now, it's, it's a woe. Now, <laughs> when it comes to God, a woe is not good. When God says woe to you, that means woe. But he gives us this thing. He says offenses must come. So here's the thing. You're going to get caught under the cabinet a few times, and people are going to dump on you. They may intend to. It may be an accident. Honestly, I wasn't doing anything I thought was wrong either. But it was disastrous for one of the two of us. I thought I couldn't be in a worse situation than I was in to be in that apartment with that stinky stuff. I thought, and then I found out, no, it could have been worse. I could have been the other guy. <laughs> but says, woe to the man who causes offenses. Wow. Hmm. Well, who's going to be doing the woeing? When people do something to you, are you the one that goes out and, and gets the revenge? Now, now listen, we're talking about relationships here. Somebody does something to you, is it your job to set the record straight? No, there may be things you need to do, and if you're led by the Holy Spirit... You'll do the right thing. But see, sometimes people are not led by the Holy Spirit. They're led by the flesh. And if you're led by the flesh, you're going to want to beat up everybody that you see. When that guy flips you the bird in the Walmart parking lot, you're going to want to get out with your 30-06 and teach him a lesson. Too much of that's going on right now. Well, let's take a look at another scripture. Galatians 5.15. Galatians 5.15. But if you bite and devour one another, how many of you know that if you bite and devour one another, that doesn't make for a good relationship? There are too many husbands and wives who are biting and devouring each other. 
There are too many friends. See, and sometimes, you know, I said, well, sometimes people aren't doing that publicly, but you can be biting and devouring each other behind each other's back. You know, gossip and talking about people is something, as a Christian, man, you need to zip it up. You need to zip it up. Oh, no. Another story. When this church first started, we were meeting in a, in a tavern. That's the only place we could rent on a Sunday morning at the Lake of the Ozarks. It wasn't being used. And uh, we had this lady with her two sons visited our church, and they sat on the front row, and your dad, your dad was doing praise and worship. So these boys, they really liked my preaching. And every time I said something, boy, the, these boys just laughed. And so we started playing off of each other. And so when the service is over, there's only like 25 or 30 people there. When the service is over, I stood over by the door and I was greeting people as they left. And, and uh, I said, you boys really like the service. You really, you think I'm funny, don't you? And when the boys laughed real loud and they looked at each other and he said, no, you just need to zip it up. Never been so embarrassed in my life. <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> but you know what? There's times when that's... The problem is you need to just zip it up. You know, the Bible will tell you what words you should say and what words you shouldn't say. And if you say, well, I can't remember, then pray in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. Because there's times when you need to talk. And there's times when you need to be quiet. Look what it says. If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Look at the next verse. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Well, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now, let me ask you something. If you know somebody that's walking in the fruit of the Spirit, would you want to be around them? They're walking in love. They're walking in joy. They're walking in peace. That word, long-suffering, that's an old English word. It doesn't mean suffering for a long time. That word could best be translated patience. Joy, peace, patient, kind, good, faithful. Next verse, 23. Gentleness. How many of you could use a little gentleness in your life? And self-control. You're dealing with somebody that controls themselves. I've been with people who were out of control. They couldn't control themselves. They get mad. They get mad and angry at everything. See, look, if you want to have good relationships, you're going, to, you're going to have to live your life in such a way that people are going to want to be around you. And some people live their lives in such a crummy way that they don't even want to be around themselves. The best thing to do is walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. What's one of the lusts of the flesh? Revenge. Well, I'm going to give them the what for. And then sometimes we say we forgive. See, forgiveness is all tied into this. We say we forgive in relationships, but we really don't. We just zip it up for a time. But when it comes around, you know, here's the deal. R.G. Lee way back in the 50s. I went to a tent revival meeting. He traveled around the United States with tents, and, and they put bales of hay out there, and people sat on the hay. And back in the 50s, and yes, I know that was like 70 years ago. Okay. But he had a sermon, and he was famous for it. It was called, There's Going to Be a Payday Sunday. And it's true. There's going to be a payday Sunday. 
But you're not going to be the one writing the check. It's going to be Jesus. Because I can show you in 1 Thessalonians, and I can show you in 2 Thessalonians, and I can show you even in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, where God, Jesus, is the avenger of those who are his children. You do something, somebody hurts you, now, now listen to me, somebody hurts you, yes, don't be ignorant and not protect yourself. Of course, you may need to get out of a situation. There may be things you need to do. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to pursue legal action. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. It's not your job to get, and you know what I'm talking about, revenge. God is the avenger of the brethren. Jesus, in Thessalonians, both letters, Paul said this. Jesus is the avenger of the brethren. See, and if you know that, you can be at peace in relationships even when people do you wrong. Because you know he's going to take care of it. Now, if you try to get revenge yourself, then what you are revealing is what Loretta was talking about earlier. You are revealing that you don't really believe God. God says, hey, just calm down. You live your life for me and be led by my spirit. I'll take care of them. That's what God's telling you. I'll take care of them. And what we should do from that point on is go, okay. And as far as we're concerned, he already has taken care of them. Why? Because he said he would. And God doesn't lie. And so I can go on and build healthy relationships with people who want healthy relationships and not hang around fools. And as we have talked in the past, and this is so true, the Bible says it many different places. We went through these scriptures. You hang around with fools and it starts leaning you in that direction. You hang around with people who do evil, and it starts leaning you in that direction. There are, a thing, there are things, listen to me, there are things that when I was a young adult, we wouldn't allow them in our house. We are now using some of those same things to babysit our children. Because our conscience has become seared to where things that were unacceptable at one time have become acceptable. And they've become acceptable just by the, the steady dripping of the faucet and we're allowing it to happen. Loretta was out of town somewhere. Oh, she was at a soccer thing or something. No, you were down at C for C. Loretta was traveling somewhere last week. And I had a little bit of time at my house. And, and I sat down with a cup of coffee, and I thought, you know, it's been a long time since I just watched a television show. So I turned on television show, and it was about, oh, five or ten minutes into it, and they used the F word. Okay, now, you say, well, everybody uses that. No, not everybody. I don't use it. You say, well, you're a preacher. You're getting paid to be good. I'm not getting paid that much. I'm not getting paid that much to be good. That's what people think, oh, you're, you're a deacon in the church. You're getting paid to be good. So I turned it off. I thought, well, I was debating between two or three other programs, you know, so I flipped it over to the other program. Well, it made it 15 minutes before they had a barrage of the F word. And you know what? You can't even listen to politicians anymore without hearing the F word. And, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Why, why, why is it being somewhat acceptable right now when it used to be just something, you know, mama would wash her mouth out with soap if she ever even thought? Why? Why is it becoming acceptable? It's the continual hearing and hearing and hearing. Let me tell you something. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's how faith comes. You want to know how doubt and unbelief come? Doubt and unbelief come by hearing and hearing 
Not the word of God, the word of the enemy. If you hear something long enough, you'll start to accept it. If you hear something long enough, you'll start to believe it. Have you ever noticed that people that listen to Fox News believe one thing and people that listen to CNN believe another? Even sometimes within the same household? Well, why is that? Why is that? It's because you start believing what you listen to. And if you, have, if you like this newscaster, next thing you know, you're believing what they say. Here, here's what we need to do. We need to go to the Word of God and believe the truth. Okay? So, friends. How many of you would like to have a friend? How many of you... So, don't raise your hand, but I want to ask you this. This is a rhetorical question. How many of you honestly, deep down inside, feel like you really don't have a friend? A good friend is hard to find. A good friend that you can trust. Now, once again, don't raise your hand, but I'll tell you this. Over the years, I personally have had a lot of friends who have betrayed me. And I know you have too. You've had somebody you put your trust in, you told them something, and next thing you know, it's on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, you should call that fake book. All right, let's take a look at Mark 11, verse 24. Mark eleven twenty-four. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. This is a scripture that this church was built upon. The New Testament hope is built upon this. If you take this and break it down in the Greek, it says, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received. In the Greek, that is past tense. Some of your Bibles even translate it that way. Believe that you have received, and the word them is italicized, it's not there. That was added by translators. Believe that you have, be, believe that you have received, and you will have. So here's faith. Faith is calling those things that be not as though they are. Faith is taking what God said and believing it in spite of what you see. Faith is knowing that God's principles for friendship and relationships work, regardless of what some psychologist may tell you. Faith is believing that when God says he will give you something, if you ask, when you ask, you believe you've already received it. We believe this. Now, but take a look at the next verse, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, and that word praying is the same word for asking, in old King James English of 1611, I remember, you may have even seen it in some movies, they, they walk into a, the king's chamber and they say, I pray thee, O king. Well, what do they mean, I pray thee, O king? I'm asking you, O king. So this word praying here means you're asking. And whenever you stand asking, if you have anything against anyone. Now, it doesn't say some things against some people. No, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Why? That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. So if somebody has done something against you, it doesn't mean that you condone what they did. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have revenge come upon them by the avenger of, of the brethren. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have to pay the price. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be a payday someday. But what it does mean is you've got to clean out your heart and you understand that it's all in God's hands. God's the one taking care of it. It's not your job to take care of it. You forgive them. Somebody said, but they're still a jerk and they're still doing it. That may be true. You know, they're an idiot. You forgive them, now they're a forgiven idiot. Okay? It doesn't change them. What it changes is you. And puts you in a better place to talk to God. Now look at this. And whenever you stand praying, praying for what? 
what we just read in the verse before, that we believe if we ask, we receive. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Why? That your Father in heaven may also forgive you. So your forgiveness for what stuff you did, to a degree, is based on if you forgive other people. Now look at the very next verse, verse 26. If you have an NIV Bible, by the way, this verse is not in there. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's a pretty big deal. So if you want to have good relationships with people, you cannot be walking around carrying all of this offendedness, unforgiveness, irritation, and hurt. Now look, when you see these people, they may have not changed. Well, what am I supposed to do when I invite them over for dinner next Saturday? Don't invite them over for dinner next Saturday. Just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean you've got to pal around with them. Doesn't mean you've got to pretend that you're, they are your best friend. It doesn't mean that you've got to pay their way in life. No. It's all internal. It's what you do. You want to have a good relationship with other people? You've got to get yourself straightened out first. And the one thing you've got to do is you can't even get your prayers answered if you don't forgive. Forgiveness is a big deal. But Pastor Larry, you just don't know what they've done to me. And I don't care. <laughs> because it's irrelevant. It doesn't, as my grandma used to say, it doesn't make a never you mind. Something like that. I don't know. It didn't make any sense when she said it either. So uh, let's take a look at Philippians 4.11. Philippians 4.11. Yep. Roma, where are you? Is Roma in here? Oh, she's over there. It's Philippians. It's Philippines. You can, oh well, never mind. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, it doesn't say that we have, we have learned to be complacent. It doesn't mean that we have learned to be tolerant. It doesn't mean that we've learned Anything other than this, to be content. Being content doesn't mean that you tolerate sin. You know, on the news, they had a minister a few weeks ago. Uh, I was watching Fox News, and this guy came on, and he was a minister. He had one of those little collar things, you know what I mean? I've been thinking about wearing one of those someday, just just to see what effect it would have. But so he must have been a godly man because he had the collar on. And they asked him this question when it came to homosexuality. What Jesus believed. And uh, he said that Jesus taught love and tolerance. And I just wanted to reach through that screen and slap that guy. Because millions of people heard him say that. Jesus never once said you tolerate sin. You don't condone sin. You don't placate people who are in sin. And one of the reasons we have the problems we have today is because we have put up with it so much. Now, this may get me thrown off a major network, which it doesn't matter because I'm not on a major network. <laughs> but when our school systems or our national library system allows a man to dress up as a drag queen 
and come to school and have drag queen reading day for the children and allow these children to be associated with and little kids and to touch and, and play with a drag queen. And then they're all given drag queen flags, which, by the way, has got six colors in the rainbow. We're taking the rainbow back, by the way. The, uh, the, well, you know, it's got six colors in the rainbow. I don't know if you've ever looked it up or not. Look it up in Wikipedia. Everything there is true. Uh, a regular rainbow outside has got seven colors. See, see, God's got seven colors in his. God's got seven colors in his. You know, the number seven is the number of what? Perfection. Number six is the number of what? Oh, that tells a story right there. Number six is the number of men. Wow. Well, we were created in the image of God. And I say this respectfully, Lord. God's not a drag queen. But when we start training our children from an early age that these things are okay, in our public schools right now, some of the coolest things in the world for the teenage girls to do is to be lesbians. It's kind of considered out there. You know? Well, it is out there. And as the church... We can be content, but we can't condone. We can't become complacent, especially in your own house. Now, I rule over my house. I've told Loretta, you cannot be a drag queen. <laughs> She's all I got living in my house. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know? Loretta. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, can we get all of the politically correctness speech out of here? Can, can, we, can we look at the Word of God and live the Word of God? Somebody may say, well, they're not hurting anybody. Oh, get out of here. They are too. They are too. I'll, I'll tell you once again, life expectancy for a man in the United States of heterosexual is in the upper 70s. It was 78 last time I checked. The life expectancy for a, uh, a gay man in the United States who admits that he is gay is 43. Loretta's brother was gay. He didn't even make it to 43. I'm telling you, sin kills Sin kills, and righteousness lives. And in our relationships, we must have holy relationships. The Bible even says, what relationship does light have with darkness? Some of you may say, well, but we need to minister to these people. Yes, you can minister to these people. Jesus, even in John 17, look, Jesus said, Lord, those who follow me that you've given me, they're in the world. They are in the world. Now listen to what he said. Go home and read that chapter. It's amazing. He said, I pray that you don't take them out of the world. Leave them in the world. How are we going to witness to the world if we're not in the world? Church people should be the mayors of the town, the policemen of the town, the school teachers. We need to be the firemen. We need to be the custodians. We need to be the teachers. We need, we need to take these positions. Jesus said, they're not of the world. They're in the world, but they're not of it. And there's a difference. See, you can minister to the world without being a part of the world. And it's a place that you can go, but you don't live there. And you've got to watch your motives, too. 
Remember years ago, a gentleman came up and said, I believe that the Lord's calling me to go over and minister at Girls, Girls, Girls. It was a place on the other side of the lake that had Girls, Girls, Girls. It was very famous at Christmas time. I used to call it Ho, Ho, Ho. <laughs> but I got into trouble for that. I got in a lot of trouble for that. That even made the newspaper that a local pastor said that. Well, it's not Christmas time, I guess. I, But at any rate, what I'm saying is, he said, I feel that I'm supposed to go over there and minister to these girls. Well, you know, I was seeing right through that. And uh, he just wanted to go over and have a laying on a hand service. Um, I said, well, these same girls go to Walmart. Why don't you go down there? <laughs> that didn't go over so good. We need to examine our motives. You love Jesus? You want to have a good relationship with people? Get right with God first, then get things right with yourself, and then forgive other people. Yes, you can have, you can have friendships that are people in the world, but you don't have to bring them into your inner circle in order to it's kind of like missionary dating. You know, you, you, way too often we've had, I've, I've been in the ministry long enough to know that when women come to me and say, the guy is a sinner, I know it, but if I marry him, I can change him. It doesn't happen. It usually happens the other way. And, uh, so get yourself right and get strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Let God guide you on who to be friends with and who not to be friends with. And develop those relationships. There is nothing much more rewarding in this life than having a good friend that you can trust. But in order to have a good friend that you can trust, you've got to be a good friend that can be trusted. All right? Say, well, boy, this, all this doesn't sound too spiritual. Yes, it is. It's very spiritual. And Jesus talked a lot about these things. Because you're not going to win the world for Jesus if you're a jerk. Nobody's going to want to hang around you if, if you're the grumpy, mean person and you, you can't, can't keep a friend because you always talk about him. And it, no, no. You've got to get yourself straightened out. And here's the thing. Then people will want to be like you, and they'll want to have what you have. Over the years, we've actually had situations where people have come up and said, look, I don't know what there is about you, but whatever it is, are, are, are you in the Kiwanis or Lions Club or something? I mean, I need to join that club. No, I'm in the Jesus Club. That's the club you need to join. All right, stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I proclaim the blessing upon these great people here today. I call forth your anointing in their lives. I thank you, Father, that they are blessed. I plead the blood of Jesus over them, and I say no weapon formed against them will prosper. And that's what's happened in other parts of the country in the last few hours will not happen in the homes or businesses of the people in this room. I call forth the protection of your word and the promise in your word that no weapon formed against us will prosper. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.